Boston is okay I'm, with the audience. I'm crazy about baseball. Uh, uh, will you stand still? Pick up your hat. Go pick up your hat. Okay. Now, look. Then you'll go and peddle your popcorn and don't interrupt the act anymore? Yes, sir. All right. But you know, strange may seem they give ball players nowadays very peculiar names. Funny names? Nicknames, pet not, names. Not as funny as my name, Sebastian Dinwiddie. Oh, oh yes, yes, yes. Funnier than that? Oh, absolutely. Whee! Yes. Now, on the St. Louis team, we have uh, who's on first, what's on second, I don't know's on third. That's what I want to find out. I want you to tell me the names of the fellows on the St. Louis I'm, team. I'm telling you, who's on first, what's on second, I don't know's on third. You know the fellows' then, names? Yes. Well, then who's playing first? Yes. I mean the fellow's name on first base. Who? The fellow playing first base for St. Louis. Who? The guy on first base. Who is on first? Well, what are you asking me for? I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. Who is on first? I'm asking you who's on first. That's the man's name. That's whose name? Yes. Well, go ahead and tell me. Who? The guy on first. Who? The first base. Who is on first? Have you got a first baseman on first? Certainly. Then who's playing first? Absolutely. When you pay off the first baseman every month, who gets the money? Every dollar of it. And why not? The man's entitled to it. Who is? Yes. So who gets it? Why shouldn't he? Sometimes his wife comes down and collects it. Who's wife? Yes. <laughs> After all, a man earns it. Who does? Absolutely. Well, all I'm trying to find out is what's the guy's name on first base? Oh, no, no, no. What is on second base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? That's what I'm trying to find out. Well, don't change the players. I'm about. not changing nobody. Take it easy. What's the guy's name on first base? What's the guy's name on second base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. He's on third. We're not talking about him. How did I get on third base? You mentioned his name. If I mention a third baseman's name, who did I say is playing third? No, who's playing first? Stay off of first, will you? Well, what do you want me to do? Now, what's the guy's name on third base? Well, what's on second? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. He's on third. There I go, back on third again. Well, I can't change their names. Will you please stay on third base, Mr. Der Broadhurst. Please. Now, what is it you want to know? What is the fella's name on third base? What is the fella's name on second base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. Third, third base. base. <laughs> you got an outfield? Oh, sure. St. Louis has got a oh, good outfield? Absolutely. The left fielder's name. Why? I don't know. I just thought I'd ask you. Well, I just thought I'd tell you. Then tell me who's playing left field. Who is playing first? Stay out of the infield! Don't mention their names out here. I want to know what's the fellow's name in left field. What is on second? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who is on first? I don't know. Third base. <laughs> oh, take it easy. Take it easy, man. It never gets old, does it? <laughs> It's one of the funniest bits in the history of comedy, and I just love it. You know, and it's all based on a misunderstanding, all based on two guys who are basically talking past each other the whole time. Costello and Abbott are talking about two different things, and neither one comprehends the other. And, of course, we know that happens in real life all the time. I've seen conversations over and over where, there, where neither party comprehends what the other is saying. I remember once years ago, my mother took our old dog Tiger to the vet, and he wrote a prescription that could be filled at the local pharmacy. But instead of putting Tiger on the script, he wrote it for Donahue Dog. Mother went to the drugstore, got the pharmacist to fill the order, but when he presented it to my mom, he took one look at the label on the bottle and said, do you mind if I ask you a personal question? She says, no, what is it? And he said, with a name like this, did your husband have trouble getting you to marry him? She said, no, 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 no. My name isn't Donahue Dog. This medicine is for thee, the Donahue Dog. It's frustrating when two people can't comprehend each other. You can almost feel the frustration between Jesus and Nicodemus in today's reading from John 3. Jesus says, no one can see... Let's, yeah, back up, Jerry. We're not, we're not there yet. <laughs> Jesus says, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. And Nicodemus asks, well, how can anyone enter into a second time in his mother's womb and be born? And then Jesus launches into this soliloquy designed to explain the difference between spirit and flesh, to which Nicodemus responds, how can these things be? And Jesus says, oh, come on. You're an educated man, a teacher of Israel, a full-grown adult, registered voter, and licensed driver, and you don't understand this stuff? 
But Nicodemus was trying. After all, he'd made the effort to come and talk to Jesus, albeit at night, a word that is loaded with narrative and theological significance in John's gospel. Nicodemus is making an effort to understand, but he didn't get it. He and Jesus are talking past each other. Maybe that's why Jesus says to him, the wind blows where it chooses and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. In other words, it's only natural that you wouldn't comprehend what I'm saying, Nicodemus. I'm talking here about matters that can't be added up on a ledger or put in as a footnote at the bottom of the page. Jesus is trying to get Nicodemus to view the world differently, to capture a glimpse of a different reality, to see the possibility of the kingdom of God coming on earth as it is in heaven. No wonder Nicodemus doesn't comprehend, but he's trying. So blessed are the uncomprehending. Blessed because at least they're trying. It's not easy to shift from one worldview to the other. Your perspective looks so rational and it's tough to see things from the other side. It's like a cartoon I saw. Jerry, let's see the first frame of that cartoon. Guy on a proverbial island in the middle of the ocean, the one palm tree, and he sees the silhouette on the horizon and he yells out, boat! Now let's go to the next one. Here's what the guy in the boat sees. He sees the island and he yells out, land! The cartoon is titled Perspective. Two different worldviews. Yeah, you can move on, Jerry. Two different worldviews that can't comprehend each other. Jesus was attempting to introduce Nicodemus to a different perspective, a different worldview. And Nicodemus, bless his heart, was trying. He just wasn't there yet. But he was trying. So blessed are the uncomprehending. Mark Hansen, former presiding bishop for the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, was on his way to a preaching engagement, and he was wearing his clerical garb like any good Lutheran minister would do. And when he boarded his flight, he found a flight attendant asleep in his seat. And so he leaned over him and shouted, Arise from the dead! Woke the poor guy up, scared him half to death, but Hansen got his seat. Well, as the flight progressed, Hanson got into an interesting conversation with that flight attendant. The guy talked about recent changes in his vocation and other aspects of his life. And then other flight attendants on the plane got in on the conversation. They talked about sin and guilt and why they had left the church. And Hanson thought how sad it was that these folks had not gotten the message that God is not in the sin accounting business. As the plane was preparing to land, two of those flight attendants brought Hanson slips of paper with sins written on them, things they called mistakes and failures. And they said, Reverend, if there's anything you can do about these, we'd be grateful. They knew something was wrong. They wanted to do something about it, but they had no idea what. So blessed are the uncomprehending, for they're open to a different worldview. Blessed are the uncomprehending, for they're wrestling with life's issues. All their questions won't get answered. Some aspects of life will always remain as mysterious and as uncontrollable as the wind. I think about Abram in Genesis 12, called by God to set out on a journey where he had absolutely no idea where he was going. It was wild faith. It was radical trust. It was extreme risk. All Abram could take to the bank was God's promise to make of him a great nation. And all Nicodemus could count on were these words. God so loved the world, including you, Nicodemus, that he gave his only son. That everyone who believes in him, including you, Nicodemus, may not perish, but have eternal life. You know, Nicodemus, God didn't send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Now, Nicodemus walked away from that encounter, still confused about a lot of things, still uncomprehending much of what Jesus has said, but his life was changed by a God who loved him just like he was. 
and who loved him too much to let him stay that way. I know you've heard me say those words a lot, but I truly believe they are the same sentiment you find in John 3.16. When, John, when Jesus said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, He was saying that God loves each one of us just like we are right now. And God loves us too much to let us stay that way. You see, I found it true in my own life. In wrestling with life's pains and regrets, I've encountered this God. And I've known so many people down through the years who could say the same thing. When life has kicked them around the block a few times and the only question on their lips is why, they too have encountered the God who loved them enough to send His Son, who loves them just like they are and loves them too much to let them stay that way. So blessed are the uncomprehending, for they're not far from the kingdom of God. Blessed are the uncomprehending, for they're willing to risk a different worldview. Blessed are the uncomprehending, because they don't come to Jesus by night because of what they have done or left undone, but because of what God has done in their lives, whether they understand it or not. Blessed are the uncomprehending, for they will encounter a Jesus who is not here to scold, but to save. Blessed are the uncomprehending, for they sense, even when they can't put all the pieces together, that Jesus' call to bear the cross is not to condemn us, but to save us. Blessed are the uncomprehending, for they are walking the line between being lost and being found. Why do we persist in defining faith by doctrines or rules or morality, all of which have their place. But there's about as much life in them as there's life in a brick. The answer to your life's issues isn't found in a slogan you can tuck in your hip pocket or store on your iPhone. The answer is a relationship, a relationship with a God who demonstrated His desperate, careless selfless love for you by sending His own Son into this world to show you how to live, how to die, and how to live again. Life is not found in analyses and conclusions and comprehension. It's found in an encounter with a God who loves you just like you are and who loves you too much to let you stay that way. Perhaps some of you remember the story of Dr. Maxwell Maltz. He was a plastic surgeon, best-selling author of the book Psycho-Cybernetics. And Maltz was once encountered by a man, let's call him Jerome, who was badly injured trying to save his parents from a burning house. Though he gave a valiant effort, he was not able to get to his parents and they both died in the fire. Furthermore, Jerome himself was left terribly burned and disfigured. And for some reason, he blamed himself for his parents' deaths and believed that God had disfigured his face as punishment for failing to save his parents' lives. Therefore, he'd given up on life, he'd given up on himself, and he'd gone into hiding. Well, Jerome had a wife, let's call her Rebecca, who loved him dearly, and she went to see Dr. Maltz and told him her husband's story. After they talked for a while, Dr. Maltz secured Rebecca's permission to visit with her husband. So he went to Jerome's room, and he, and he knocked. No answer. He knocked again. No response. He called loudly through the door, Jerome, I know you're in there, and I know you can hear me. My name is Dr. Maxwell Maltz. I'm a plastic surgeon, and I want you to know that I can restore your face. Still no sound from inside the room. So he called again, please come out and let's talk about restoring your face. Nothing. Finally, Dr. Moss said, Jerome, if you want to punish yourself like this, that's your business, but I need to tell you something. Rebecca came to see me, 
She's worried about you. And she loves you very much. In fact, Jerome, she didn't really come to ask me to help you because she knew that you wouldn't let me. What Rebecca wants me to do is to disfigure her face too. She says she wants to be with you, and if that means having her face ruined like yours, she's willing to do that. That's how much she loves you. That's how much she wants to help you. For a moment, nothing stirred as before. And then slowly, ever so slowly, the doorknob began to turn. And the door opened a crack. And then it swung wide open. And the disfigured man stepped out to begin a new life. To be set free. Brought out of hiding by a woman who loved her husband just like he was. And who loved him too much to let him stay that way. Blessed are the uncomprehending. For all they know is this. God so loved the world, including you that He gave His only Son so that everyone who believes in Him, including you, may not perish, but have eternal life.